We have an introduction to Mac OS kernel exploitation by Jeff Ball. Uh, so my name's Jeff Ball. I'm going to talk a little bit of, about Mac OS kernel exploitation, as he just mentioned. Uh, first off, who am I? I'm a researcher at Grimm. I'm also a member of the DEF CON group of Orange County, and my handle is JeffBall at 55 on Twitter if you want to look me up later. So first we're going to talk a little bit about why we will care about trying to exploit the Mac OS kernel. Uh, the first reason is obviously that it controls all of the authorization checks and prevents any type of system modifications that you might want to do. And so if you can exploit the kernel, then you can obviously bypass these. And so that's the, the, the most obvious reason why you would want to. The second reason is that a lot of software has started sandboxing itself. So uh, for instance, Safari will sandbox any of the more complicated processing. And it's one way you can break out of sandboxes. Because oftentimes, when you're inside the sandbox, you can still talk to the kernel. And so if you can exploit the kernel, you can easily just bypass and get out of the sandbox without having to uh, go through and try and exploit the, the other half of the unsandbox process. And so it's just oftentimes seen as the easier of the two approaches to just exploit the kernel and get out that way rather than trying to go the other way. And so those are kind of the two of the more uh, main ones, the second one being a more recent concern. Um, next, I'm just going to talk a little bit about an introduction to the XNU kernel, which is the Mac OS kernel. Um, so the XNU kernel is actually a combination of two kernels. There's the mock half and the BSD half. Um, mock was an early research project out of Carnegie Mellon. It is actually a microkernel. And so what that is is it tries to only have the components that are necessary to be running inside of ring three as compared to a monolithic one like the other half or the BSD half. <laughs> and so what that means is it will do simple things like message passing, memory management, scheduling, but the rest is run as applications inside of user land. And so if my application wants to send a network packet, I don't actually talk to the kernel to send that network packet. I pass a message to the networking application, which then sends the network packet out. As compared to within traditional monolithic kernels like Linux or Windows, I just talk to the kernel directly, and that code that does the network parsing and uh, network sending of packets is inside of the kernel. And so uh, it can be seen to be a much more secure approach because if you uh, were to exploit the networking application, you only gain access to that application and not the entire OS. <coughs> so macOS is actually a combination of that and the monolithic kernel of BSD. Um, so the BSD half provides things like the uh, disk I.O. and networking I.O., management of processes, whereas the mock half does things like memory management, uh, interprocess communication messages, and uh, managing of tasks and threads. Uh, one other thing to note is the XNU kernel is open source. Apple puts it up on opensource.apple.com, and they also have a GitHub that lags slightly behind their website. Uh, you can go and get it, compile it, and make changes and install it yourself on your MacBook. Um, they don't always have the latest version up, so they will put up the new versions of the kernel open sourced slightly after. So for instance, right now, the latest version that's open source is 10.13.6, and they're on to 10.14 uh, for uh, Mojave. So um, a little bit about the mock half that's important for, to know for exploitation is um, mock is heavily based on passaging messages. Uh, and so if you want to talk to a service, you pass a message to it. And those are called mock messages. <laughs> On the other hand, and when you pass a uh, message, you pass it to a processes or a task mock port, which is basically just an endpoint for you to receive a one directional mock message. Um, the ports themselves have access restrictions, which are known as port rights in mock terminology, and those being send, send once, and receive. Send is obvious. You can send, if you have the send right on a port, you can send a mock message to it. Receive is also obvious. If you have the receive right, you are the, the receiver for that mock port. You get all messages from, uh, that are sent to that port. And then send once means you, you're allowed to send a mock message to a port once. That's often used for um, callback functionality. So if I have the receive port and someone sends me a message, and they want me to be able to talk back, they'll give me a send once write to one of their own ports. And so through that mechanism, I can then use that send write 
or send once write to send a message back. <coughs> the other thing that's important to note is that these mock port writes can be passed through mock messages. Um, so you can send it to another process or another process can send it to you. And that's actually how you get the port writes for other services. Um, these mock ports and mock messages are how a large portion of the services and kernel API is accessed from userland. So for instance, if I want to draw something on the screen, I will get a port write to the Windows server, which is the process on Mac OS that does all of the drawing, and I will send a mock message requesting that it draw something on the screen. Uh, and then in addition to the processes like Windows, the Windows service, the kernel actually has a number of ports as well that it listens on that you can send messages to, as we'll see on the next slide. Um, one other thing that's uh, useful to know, especially when talking about exploiting through the use of mock ports and messages, is task ports. Task ports are like other ports, except as the name implies, they focus on managing a task. And so this allows, if you have the task port to a task or pro, uh, process, the um, one side note, the processes are the BSD term and tasks are the mock term. They are correlated in that each process has a corresponding task, but um, I'm going to basically use them interchangeably. But anyway, um, if you have the task port for a task, it lets you do things like create a thread, fork it, terminate, and very usefully read and write the memory of that task. Um, that's useful for the debugger, and so things like LLDB and GDB will use task ports to debug other processes. We'll see a little bit later how they're useful for um, exploitation. The next component that I'm going to talk about is IOKit. IOKit is kind of another portion of the kernel that is the device driver framework. It allows you to create device drivers without having to code the whole thing yourself. It's a C++ wrapper that allows you to just extend off of base classes most related to your uh, driver. And so they, there's a number of classes that you can inherit off of that will have most of the functionality you'll need with you just needing to implement the specific components related to your device. Um, when you code a, de a device driver in IOKit, one of the things that you can do is you register that driver with the IO registry. Um, through that, the user land components that want to talk to your driver, they will look it up uh, via the IO registry and create an IO user client, which is just the IO frameworks class for talking to that driver. And then you can define functions in the driver that uh, the user land can call with their own values. And so if you want to provide a way for user, a user land process to talk to your driver in order to make it work, you just register it with the IO registry. The user land process creates an IO user client, and then it just calls the functions in your driver that you've defined for that purpose. Um, one of the, uh, internally this is all based off of mock messages. The IO kit framework in user land, when you say please call this driver method, or please give me a user client for this driver, will talk to the IO kit master port, which is a mock port, and it will say please call this method on behalf of this user client. Um, one thing you can do is you can, sorry, screen size changed. Uh, you can look and see what, what um, uh, drive, IO kit drivers are available via the IO reg command. And so in this, you can see that I have the VirtualBox driver at the bottom. That's installed, and if I want to talk to it, I would make a uh, VirtualBox USB uh, user client, and then I would be able to call the various uh, functions that the VirtualBox driver has. Oh, shoot, sorry. Let me get out of that. Uh, that's good you told me now, because I have a bunch. Oh, wow. This changed size on me. Well, all right, there's the VMware one, because I also have that installed. But uh, So if I wanted to, I could talk to that kernel extension by making a VMware USB port uh, USB client and then calling the functions that that driver has set up for to me to call. Um, so <coughs> that's just one of the areas of tax surfaces of all of these drivers here. Um, it's very hard to see at this huge screen size, but it's actually a hierarchy with um, drivers having multiple different classes. Anywho. Uh, anyway, so moving on, the just to talk a little bit about the attack surface that's available if you're trying to go after the XNU kernel. 
Uh, obviously, like most OSs, it's got syscalls. Um, the, there's the BSD half, which has over 500 syscalls, and Ma um, Apple keeps changing them with each kernel update. And so they will introduce new functionality, which means new bugs, as well as some of the old ones also have still bugs, and they continue to find bugs in the large number of syscalls that BSD provides. And then additionally, because <coughs> the XNU kernel is split in half, there's also the mock half, which has their traps, which is just another terminology for how they talk about syscalls. Uh, those also have had bugs in recent years. Uh, Ian Beers found one and wrote a jailbreak using it um, just, I think, last year. Uh, additionally, like Linux, there's device files, and those device files have ioctals, and so that is another part, place where user uh, values and user uh, data can be parsed, which may lead to bugs. Um, networking protocols also have uh, taken user input, and so just um, a week and a half ago or so, there was the ICMP error uh, vulnerability, which the networking code inside of the BSD half for ICMP error messages uh, incorrectly read or trusted a length inside of the packet, which led to a heap overflow, which can lead to memory corrupt, or which will lead to memory corruption and can possibly be exploited. So um, that code, while it has been there for a while, is still having bugs as simple as not checking a header length. So um, that could also be another area. And then one of the areas that I'm going to talk a little bit more about today and the vulnerability we'll focus on is inside of an IO kit driver. Um, device drivers are notorious for having bugs because they aren't as widely used or as looked at as the rest of the kernel. And they also parse user data. And so if a device driver author forgets to check a value, that might lead to a vulnerability. And we'll see how that uh, actually can and how that vulnerability can be exploited in a little bit. Um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the methods of debugging or testing while you're trying to write an exploit. And so what can you do to try and help yourself out uh, to make things a little bit easier? Um, so the first thing I said, uh, or I already mentioned, is that XNU is open source, and you can compile and install it and make changes to it. It's um, a little bit of a process. There's oftentimes uh, slight changes to the build system that, or build mechanisms that you'll need to make in order to get it compiled. But there are some handy guides online you can find. Oftentimes, you'll have to make small corrections to the source code, such as just commenting out or casting a field that, that um, uh, a compiler option would cause a warning that will make the build not work. Um, so one of the things you can do while you're debugging things is just add print statements and look at dmessage. It can be a little bit of a, a process to recompile it and reinstall it every time, but it is a very simple way to try and see what's going on in the kernel. <clears throat> uh, the kernel also does have some code to not print out pointers, so you'll have to get rid of that as well if you try and print out pointers when debugging things. Overall, it's not the most effective way, but it's very simple. Um, the next one is if you manage to crash the kernel, you can see an output uh, from the panic log dumper. And so if you want to know what happened, you can look at that. Um, and I have an example again, which will probably be misformatted. Ah, so it's not that bad. But anyway, it looks a little bit like this. Uh, if you crash the kernel, you can see it will dump all of the registers and then give you a stack trace as well. And so if you're trying to figure out what exactly happened, you can come see and think, oh, this value is in R the RAX register. I thought it would be this value. And so it's, again, not the most helpful, but it is somewhat useful after the, you've crashed it and you're trying to figure out what happened, what went wrong with my exploit. Um, in the stack trace, you can see in this one, I was overwriting the stack with this nonsense value, so it failed to walk its full way back up the stack. And so you can see the frame pointer is just 333. Um, so again, another useful, uh, useful thing you can do while debugging, but not the most useful. Um, Zprint. Zprint is a heap-specific tool. It prints out the heap uh, allocations from the zone allocator. It will tell you how many of each uh, zone is allocated, and you can use that while heap spraying or trying to look at when memory allocations are made. It's um, very useful if you're trying to exploit a heap-based um, vulnerability. <coughs> so um, this right, sorry. Oof. 
Is that too small to see? Yes. All right, how about that? Um, in this, it's just zprint printing out the calic, which is one of the main allocators in the kernel. It's printing out the number of elements in each zone. So for instance, if we have a vulnerability that affects a specific zone, such as the 256 one, we can take a look at the number of allocations in that. And we can, whenever we're trying to do something like heap flood, this will tell us when uh, new ones are being made or when they're being released. And we kind of can track the progress of what's going on with the Cal uh, in the Calic 256 zone. This is kind of a specific tool that's really only useful if you're trying to exploit a heap-based vulnerability. Um, the next tool, which is very useful for a lot of different situations, is one by um, Siguza. It's called iOS Kernel Tools. It's also available for macOS, so it's uh, useful for this as well. And what that does is it shows you the kernel memory map, and then it also allows you to read and write kernel memory. And so uh, if you're trying to figure out what happened or what's at a specific address in the kernel memory, you can use these tools. Um, one downside is it does require you to already have roots, so obviously uh, you can't use it in an exploit. It also requires you to have already exported a kernel task port to user land. And I'll get into what that means in, in a little bit when we look at our exploit. Um, the other thing that you can do instead of already having a, a kernel task port is you can recompile your kernel and patch it to allow for this. I have in the re repository that I'm going to push with this talk, I have instructions on how to do that. And now just let's take a quick look at it. If I can get that to leave. Does that work? All right, good. Um, so in this uh, kernel, I have already, like I said, it requires root. Uh, and so as you can probably would have been able to see with better formatting, this is the kernel memory map. It shows you what is at each address. And so for instance, on this one, uh, it shows you that there is a kernel extension with 16K of memory, read, write permissions. And so uh, you can just basically see where everything is in the kernel's memory. And so if you're trying to figure out what is at a specific uh, allocation or um, where it is in memory, you can use these tools. Um, one of the other ones, it's also useful, it's called uh, KMEM, that stands for kernel memory. And as you can probably guess from the name, it allows you to read and write memory. And so uh, what I'm asking it there is to print out 40 bytes at that address. And so that'll just show us that that string is at that address in the kernel memory. We can also use this tool to write to kernel memory if we want to try out um, a payload or a post-exploitation uh, mechanism without actually having to re-exploit it, the kernel, each time. Um, so you can use these tools for that purpose as well. They're very useful, and I highly recommend them. Um, and then the last tool, which is probably the most useful, but also the most um, the it, most work to set up and is also a little buggy, is just kernel debugging. You can set up the debugger for the kernel and then step through it or set breakpoints and read memory. Or if it crashes, it'll come back to you and you can see what happened. Uh, one thing you do have to do is run that NV, change the NVRAMs to include uh, that command. However, you can't do that uh, while SIP is on, so it requires you to reboot into system recovery or turn off uh, system integrity protection yourself. Uh, so uh, one thing that to note is that the Apple, all, in addition to making the source, they make the kernel debug symbols available for uh, the official Apple oh, um, kernels. So if you want to debug an official kernel, you can just go download the symbols with an Apple developer account and install them and then use that in the debugger. So just to show that off a little bit. Uh, simply start the debugger, then you just tell it to load the kernel debugger symbols. And I compiled the kernel that that VM is running, and so uh, I have the symbols there. Then you can load up that command, the KDP remote command with the IP address of the VM or the other computer that you're debugging. This does work over the network. And then you hit the magic key combination to tell the debugger to start up in the kernel. Um, this for uh, Apple is control, option, uh, command, shift, escape. 
So right now that VM is frozen, and if we go back to the debugger and try and connect to it, you'll see that it loads it up, and we've now stopped at that address inside of the debugger. And so what you can do is you can set breakpoints or read and write memory or registers, and then continue the, uh, just hit, ent hit con type continue and hit enter, and the, the OS will start up. And until it hits a breakpoint or you crash the kernel, uh, you won't be given context back to it. <coughs> and so, uh, this is useful. You could set breakpoints on your ROP gadgets or at the vulnerability and read the registers in memory and see what all is happening and where things are going wrong or how you can adjust things accordingly. This is um, just a super useful, but it, it also is a little buggy. Oftentimes it just crashes or you don't, your breakpoints might not be hit, so it does have its faults, but it's very useful. Uh, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the mitigations for kernel uh, exploits that are present in the XNU kernel. So the first one is kernel address space layout randomization. Uh, the macOS kernel is actually uh, loaded at any one of 256 different spots in memory. Uh, they randomly pick a slide value, and then that gets added to the load address of the kernel. And so um, each each load address is two, megabar two megabytes apart, and so there's 512, um, or 510 different um, megabytes that it could be changed. So uh, essentially, if you're trying to exploit and you try to hard code an address, that will only work one out of 256 times, and so it's not a very useful thing. You need to find a way to leak that address and calculate it. <coughs> For development, uh, purposes, there's the CAS info, which stands for kernel address space info, uh, syscall that you can call, and that will actually just give you back the, the kernel slide. And so it's very useful to start out with uh, using the CAS info syscall until you've worked up your exploit to be able to leak that address. Um, one thing to note is that does, of course, require root because they don't want to just have a, a, a KSLR bypass, and it only works with system integrity protection disabled or a compiled kernel to remove that. On the, on the left, you can just see, uh, we can see that the kernel on the first with a slide of zero is loaded at that base address, which is the default one. And then with a slide of D with six zeros, it gets loaded at D with six zeros higher than the, the zero slide. It's not a very complicated uh, randomization and it's also rather weak, as we'll see. Uh, the next mitigation that uh, Mac OS has is supervisor mode execution uh, protection. And so what that does is uh, the kernel will refuse to run in, run in user land memory. And so if you try to tell it to jump to, a, a use, to code inside the user land, the processor will actually throw an exception. And when that happens, the kernel crashes and your exploit won't work. Um, prior to this, you could just, if you were overwriting a function pointer, you could just overwrite the function pointer with a hard-coded address that you put code at in user land and the kernel would jump to it. You could run a little snippet of code that would do whatever your desired effect was. And then uh, you could just clean up and it would, that would be as complicated as it got. Uh, now, uh, now we can't do that anymore and we have to find some other way to run code that's not from user land pages. Um, the next mitigation is supervisor mode access protection or SMAP. Uh, it's another Intel processor feature that is only recent, so only the late, later 2016 and, and, and on models of MacBooks have them. Essentially, it's very similar to the exploit protection, except uh, it is for reading and writing memory from user land. So the kernel will refuse to read or write memory directly from user land. Obviously, this can't be on all the time, so the macOS kernel just selectively turns it on and off when it it's meant to. And so if you're not in, using one of the specific functions to copy data from you, user land, SMAP will be, the SMAP protection will be on. If you are inside one of those specific functions, it will be off. And so what this does is if the vulnerability allows us to dereference an arbitrary, arbitrary address or read something from an arbitrary address, we can't host our, um, that data inside of a user land process. We need to get it into the kernel land memory somehow. And so this is just another one of those protections that makes our job as an exploit writer harder. And then the final mitigation I'll talk about is not really an exploit mitigation, more of just a defense against uh, a successful exploit 
of some other non-kernel means. And so it's um, system integrity protection, also known as rootless, when it was first introduced. Uh, the name is actually kind of a misnomer, which is why they changed it. There's still a root account, it's just less powerful. System integrity pr uh, protection prevents you from, as the root user, doing certain actions. So if I want to write to, to the bin directory to change some process or debug some, one of Apple's uh, processes, system integrity protection won't let me. And so even as the root user, which, where I was, I'm supposed to have ultimate authority to do whatever I want, on Mac OS I can't. Whereas on something like Linux, the root user is all powerful and can do that. This is implemented through um, Mac OS's mandatory access control framework, which is based off of trusted BSD, which is essentially just a large number of kernel hooks scattered throughout the kernel that whenever an action such as creating a file or opening a socket or, uh, happens, the kernel will call one of those ho hooks for the installed policies and that function hook will decide is this user allowed to write uh, to this file or open the socket and so on. Uh, we can just take a, a quick look at that. And so this is, sorry, it's going to keep getting me. <clears throat> so this is the struct uh, inside the kernel that has all of the function pointers. And so for instance, we have the check file. Oh, it's down there. Sorry. The file check function pointer. Uh, when I go to create a file, the kernel will iterate over each of the policies and check if that function pointer is defined, and it will call that function uh, if for each policy. And system integrity protection is just one of the policies that are in that. And we'll see how we can neuter this by knopping out those function pointers later on. Just a little demo of system integrity protection. Actually, first I have to change snapshots. So that previous one was after the exploit so that I could show the iOS current utils. So, well, that's lovely. Alrighty, so the CSR util is a simple utility which lets you turn on and off um, system integrity protection. It obviously can only run recovery mode or if SIP is already turned off. And you can use the status command to just check. And so we can see that it is enabled. And so if I, yeah, I'm the root user right now, but if I try to write to the bin directory, I'm not allowed. So it just tells me operation not permitted because SIP's policy uh, function for create files was called and it said, oh, you're trying to write to the bin directory. I'm not going to allow it because that would be a system modification. And SIP's purpose is to not allow that. <coughs> so that is system integrity protection. We'll see how to turn that off in a second. Um, so next, we're gonna, I'm going to show off a specific vulnerability, and then we'll talk through how you go about creating an exploit for it. Uh, the vulnerability that I chose for this case study is um, that CV up there, which is a vulnerability in the AVE Bridge dri IO kit driver. It was originally found by Alex Plaskett. Um, the URL for that is down there when you go to pull up the slides. Uh, this is a IO kit uh, func driver function. You can call it from kernel with a user controlled value. Um, and so what it is, is this user controlled value is passed into the command gates array, which is for this C++ object. It uh, has an index off it, and then it calls a C++ function of one of the objects in that array. However, the array is not checked to make sure that uh, it is within the bounds of, of the, or the array. Uh, just a little visualization of that. We have our AVE bridge object up there, and there's a command gates array which has four objects in it. It's only four value long. However, they don't check the index, so we can fill in any value, and it will go to, to whatever that address is in memory and try and read out a pointer to a C++ IO command gate object. <coughs> and then it will uh, read the vtable out uh, pointer from that command object, and then dereference it. If you're not familiar with C++ V tables, they're essentially just arrays of function pointers for a class. And so what this is doing is when I, I say 
uh, zero for that index. It, call, it goes to the zeroth item. It reads the pointer out, goes to the vtable pointer, reads it out again, which goes to right here. It adds an offset to it. And in this case, it's trying to call the run action function, which is 1c8 down from the top of the vtable. It will read that pointer, and then it jumps to it. And so, uh, however, if we give it a much larger index, it will try and read something from memory up here, which clearly won't point at one of these IO command gates, and things will go wrong. If it can't read, if that isn't a valid pointer, it'll crash. If it is, it will try and use that as if it were an, I an IO command gate and try and read a vtable pointer out. And so we'll look at how we can kind of fake that out and cause it to jump to our code. Um, so now I'm just going to talk a couple, about a couple techniques that we'll look at and for bypassing some of the mitigations as well as exploiting. Um, the first one is one of the um, Im important things to do is spray the memory. Because we don't know where that object is in memory, um, specifically because of the KSLR slide, we'll, we'll need to spray the memory. And so we'll have, what that we do with that is we allocate a large number of, of blocks and we fill those blocks with our fake object pointers. And then uh, when the kernel, at, uh, we give it an index larger than that, it will reach around past the top of the memory back into our user land memory and somewhere within the spray. Uh, what we'll do is we'll actually spray two gigabytes of memory so that that 512 megabyte slide that it could possibly have is just minuscule in comparison and it will always land within our two gigabyte spray. Um, one thing to note about when you're doing this in user land you don't actually need to allocate, allocate the two gigabytes of memory. You can just use duplicated memory mappings to, all, to set up that memory with your spray without actually adding more. Because you, the memory uh, is copy on write or it's only allocated when you change it, you can make as many of those as you want. And you can actually allocate more uh, in your spray than uh, memory than you have in your laptop. So for instance, this MacBook has 16 gigabytes of memory. But using duplicated memory mappings, I was able to spray 32 gigabytes of memory, or however much I want, because it's not actually allocated. And so as you can see, on the left, without the spray, if we use a hard-coded index, it'll point. If the slide is zero, it might actually point to our user memory. If it's not, then it might not point to our user memory. Whereas if we just have a two gigabyte spray, it will always hit somewhere in our user, our user land memory. Um, how we'll use that uh, just looks a little bit like this. <laughs> what we'll do is we will spray fake vtable pointers, um, which are essentially these pointers out, uh, right here. Or sorry, the pointers right here. We'll spray a bunch of fake vtable pointers as if that was the, the IO command gate objects. Then we'll use a hard-coded index. It will wrap, the memory will wrap back around, back to right here. And then these will all point to our payload pointer, which would be essentially a normally point at run action, but will instead point to our payload. And so, and that's how we'll get code execution. Um, one of the things to note is if we were to try that, it wouldn't work because of SMAP. If your computer is new enough uh, and you have SMAP, that when you try and point it into user land memory, it'll actually just crash because of um, the processor exception. So instead, what you can do is you can spray the kernel with that um, memory and, so, and then point it into the kernel instead. Uh, there's a number of IO kit classes which you can allocate via various APIs with the kernel in kernel memory. One of the more useful ones is called OS, OS string, which is simply just an IOKit string object. Uh, they're very useful because you can set the, all of the content, you can create them or delete them or read them back whenever you want, and you can make them of arbitrary size. And so what you can do is you can create many large string objects and, and it will actually allocate that in memory and once you've filled up the available free slots, they will all be allocated in a row. And so uh, that lets you uh, allocate, uh, use a hard-coded memory address because it's such a large uh, amount of memory. And so for this MacBook, I was actually able to spray two gigabytes of memory and find that the address FFFFF9258, with followed by six zeros, uh, is always allocated and always set to my content if I've sprayed two gigabytes of memory. And so we can use that uh, to point things there uh, and uh, when we need to bypass SMAP. This specific laptop does not, so we don't have to bypass that. Um, this laptop actually does have SMAP, though, so we will have to bypass that. And the way that's done is simply through return-oriented programming or ROP. 
like you would uh, in a normal uh, user land exploitation as well. Uh, what that does, essentially just you set the stack to value that you control, and then you will set one address you want to run, um, any values it uses, and then uh, the red instruction will read that address and execute this little code snippets that you can then combine to do something. In this example on the right, we have a gadget that's pop RDI ret, and so what that will do is it will pop this RDI value into the RDI register off the stack, and then the ret will load the next gadget, which is a pop RSI, which will do the same with the RSI value. And through that means you can set the registers, and then if you put a function address on there, it will call that function. As x86 is fast call, or takes the arguments via the registers, that will call a function with our arguments that we, we want. And so uh, through that, we can run our little bits of code without actually having to get that code um, loaded up into kernel memory in, in an executable memory region. Uh, one of the other things to note is the function thread exception return, which is a very useful function when doing ROP. Uh, what that function does is it will just stop the kernel context and return to user land wherever you are. And so how that's useful uh, is such that if you don't safely end your ROP chain, the kernel will crash. And when it crashes, you obviously, the OS goes down and you can't use anything that you just did in your um, ROP chain. And so you need to safely exit your ROP chain or return it back to the normal context. And there's two ways of doing that. One is the complicated way of getting back onto the correct stack uh, frame with the correct values on it in order to continue execution. The other way, which is much easier, is just to call the function thread exception return. Um, in normal user land exploitation, this doesn't really matter as much because you can just let your process crash and uh, you, after you, you've achieved whatever you were trying to. In kernel land, that would cause the OS to crash. And so just throwing that function on there, it will terminate your ROP chain. Um, how we'll use that uh, is simply we'll just, rather than pointing the payload buffer into our payload, we'll point it up into a kernel ROP gadget. Uh, the first ROP gadget is our stack pivot. And so what that does in this in this uh, vulnerability, REX points into content we control. And so what we'll do is we'll push, the first gadget pushes REX onto the stack and then pops it into the stack pointer. And so what that does is it just allows us to set the stack to our content and lets us set up those gadgets on the stack uh, that we'll run. After that, we just set up uh, our ROP chain to call whatever functions we want. Um, so uh, specifically, we want that, those ROP gadgets to make us become root. And so this little snippet of code we will run in ROP gadgets that will grab the current process struct out of kernel memory. It will take the credentials out of that and then the POSIX credentials, which is just an inner wrapper inside of the credential struct, and it will assign zero, or the ID for root, to the saved user ID pointer. And so that little snippet of code essentially makes our process um, have root privileges. We'll just use the set UID to take the saved UID pointer and make it the effective one again, and then we've become root because we've modified the structure that holds what user we are in kernel memory. Um, after we've become root, <coughs> the next thing we're going to want to do is get a kernel task port exported to user land. I mentioned that was what you needed to, in order to use the iOS kern utils um, to read and write kernel memory, and this is actually how it's accomplished. The kernel is a task just like any other. Its task is given PID0. It's the first task, obviously. Um, and because it's a task, you can use the normal read and write uh, mock API in order to read and write kernel memory if you have the kernel task board. Um, so the VM read and VM write functions, they can be used to just read it like you would any other process with that kernel task board. And so what we'll do is we'll have our ROP chain grab that kernel task port and shove it into the real hosts array. The real hosts array is a functionality in the, the, the Mac OS kernel which holds a number of ports that you can query from user land and obtain. And so if you want to grab a uh, port to a service like the auto mount daemon or the audit daemon, you can ask the kernel to retrieve one of those for you and give it to you so that you can talk to those various daemons. However, there are some empty slots in there and we'll just use our ROP chain to copy the pointer to the kernel task to one of those empty slots. And then whenever our, any user land process wants to 
uh, have to modify kernel memory or read kernel memory, they can ask the kernel for that specific port out of the real hosts array and then use that to call the VM read and VM write functions. That's actually become one of the more standard techniques and so a lot of tools such as the iOS kernel utils will try and retrieve that port uh, to, to grab the kernel uh, task port and then they can use that to read and write memory. Um, so then one of the uh, the next thing we'll want to do, uh, now that we have the ability to read and write memory, but when we don't have to use complicated ROP to do it, we can just ask for the task port and call the normal functionalities, is we'll want to uh, neuter system integrity protection or just turn it off. And so it's actually rather trivial once you've obtained kernel memory read-write ability. And so there's a symbol called MAC policy list, which lists all of the policies that are currently enforced for the uh, for Mac OS, and so we'll just read that uh, area of memory out of the kernel and update it so all of those function pointers we saw were, are now zero. Um, we can just take a look at what that... Let's take a look at what that, how that's done. Uh, the macros here, kread and kwrite, just read from kernel memory. Yeah, maybe that's better. Um, so at the top, you can see we're reading out the Mac policy list, and then we go down here to the for loop where we iterate over each entry in that list. We'll read the list out of memory. If it's not um, null or that slot isn't empty, we'll then read the specific policy out and the function pointers that make up that policy, and then we'll just change them all to be null. And so then next time the kernel uh, goes to call one of these functions, that function pointer will be null, and the kernel will think, hey, there, that policy doesn't define it. It doesn't care about that specific action. And so the one that, as I showed before, in the file check create, um, that function is called when we create a uh, file. But if that pointer is now null, it won't actually be called. And so if we do that to the system integrity, uh, and then down here we write it out. If we do that to the system integrity protection policy, that will essentially turn it off. And so we've written it back to kernel memory with all those modified function pointers, and it's essentially neutered. So now just to show off the exploit that we've been building. So once again, we can't, we can't modify it even though we're root. Let's go over here to where we're not root. We'll run our exploit, and we get a root shell. Um, essentially what happened was we sprayed our memory, set up the ROP gadgets uh, so that uh, the sprayed memory points into the pointer to our ROP gadgets. Uh, we triggered the vulnerability with a hard-coded index, which caused it to wrap around past the end of memory back into our sprayed memory. Uh, then it would call, uh, it dereferences that, dereferences again to the pointer to our op gadgets, runs each of them, then we call that thread exception return function, uh, which returns back to user land after it, our op chain has copied the kernel task pointer into that real host array. We use the set UID to become root after our op chain fixed our credentials to be zero. And then we called uh, the API to get that kernel task pointer back, and we used it to modify the system integrity protections uh, function hooks so that they're all zero. And then we just launch a root shell, and now you can see I'm root, and if I want to change the bin directory, I can just however I want. All of those function pointers are no longer called, so I'm essentially allowed to do whatever I want without system integrity protection stopping me. Um, so, and that's kind of conclusion. Let's hope that was helpful if you go to try and exploit the Mac OS kernel. Um, I'll be pushing all the materials for this talk to that URL later today. Um, and that's my contact info if you have any questions afterwards. If there's any questions now, I can take them or we can go to lunch. Um, Jack, do you have a business card I can have? Yes. Great, all right.
it's real hard to um, because essentially all of those tools are going to run at the kernel level and you're also running at the kernel level after you've successfully exploited them. Uh, what one of the more effective things that is, can be done about this is sandboxing. And so I mentioned how uh, kernel exploits are kind of a way around the sandbox, but in some cases you're not actually allowed to call various APIs to the kernel. And so that actually can be a way to lower the attack surface. If you want to stop these, it's really more useful to stop the uh, to not expose that attack surface than it is to try and catch it after they're running their own code at kernel level, since uh, if you're running at the same protection levels. What um, that Apple actually does with iOS is they have higher levels of it with the secure element, and so the secure element uh, is one level above the kernel, and so it can actually look down and try and catch various things. And so uh, that doesn't really exist on macOS, which is why it's kind of an easier target. Problem. With the exploit that you were running and the changes that you were making on the kernel, would that persist originally? Uh, so that specifically does not. In fact, um, if I go back there, you can actually see it's still, it still, it actually still thinks system integrity protection is enabled because all I did was neuter it. Um, however, the CSR utils will now actually work to disable it or changing, the, the way you disable it is by changing the NVRAM, and I, and I nuked the, the uh, function pointers that prevented you from changing NVRAM. So now I can turn it off if I wanted to, but these, this specific exploit doesn't do that because I was just trying to show off how you can change kernel memory. But now you're outside of SIP, and once you're outside of SIP, you can make any changes you want to the NVRAM. It's essentially the way you turn it off uh, without an exploit is you boot up into recovery mode where SIP isn't enabled except now SIP is just not enabled because of my exploit. Oh, um. all right.